The American holiday of Thanksgiving has a lot of mixed baggage. I don't need to dredge up the human rights violations which originated the holiday since that's boring human stuff none of you have signed up for. As it's practiced today, Thanksgiving is more or less a secular holiday in which families the country over give thanks for what they have and share a big fat meal of varying carbaceous or proteinous substances. One of the most important to any Thanksgiving dinner is the turkey. Imagine, if you will, an alternate reality in which dinosaurs never went extinct and humans somehow evolved anyway. Instead of the turkey, we now have a plump, juicy, well-cooked, seasoned, and stuffed velociraptor carcass to carve. Would we want this? Would it taste good? Let's find out. Many of us have wondered what dinosaurs taste like. It's a natural thought to have. After learning about the beasts as children, and after reading about them in books, the next step from wonder and awe is the crockpot. Dino nuggets definitely play a huge role in this thought process. Many folks have thrown out this thought as pure nonsense and something not to be entertained. But where's the fun in that? The fact of the matter is, we already do eat dinosaurs. Since birds are dinosaurs, we've been eating them since the dawn of humanity. Your chicken nuggets, deep fried drumsticks, Thanksgiving turkey dinner, pecking duck, and more are all processed bits of dino. For this Thanksgiving themed video, I wanted to find the answer to the question of what the most turkey-like dinosaur would taste like. If we're going off looks alone, I think Therizinosaurs, Ovaraptorosaurs, and Ornithomimosaurs would be the most turkey-like. However, how could I not start off the culinary journey through paleontology without first starting with either the Tyrant Lizard King or the Six Foot Turkey? <laughs> Instead of the ostrich, sloth, or parrot dinosaurs, we'll be zeroing in on the tenderloins and breast meats of the swift thief, Velociraptor. Before we can configure the hypothetical scenario in which we've got ourselves a Velociraptor carcass, we need to understand what makes meat well, meat. This is where biology, culinary science, and anatomy come into play. What makes meat meat? The stuff we call meat consists almost entirely of the muscles of animals. Some weirdos eat the organs and soft tissues too, but let's stay away from them and give them the side eye. Muscles are composed of fibers bunched together into rope-like strands. At the smallest scale, it's just one fiber. One fiber is bunched into a group of fibers. Those groups are bunched into bigger and bigger groups. At the largest naked eye scale, they just look like blobs of yummy flesh primed for the grill or barbecue. Meat itself can be broadly categorized into two groups, light meat and dark meat. The distinction between light and dark meat goes beyond their shades. Light meat is made of a muscle type known as fast twitch muscle fiber. Fast twitch muscle fibers, as their name suggests, help an organism move very fast in a very short period of time. They snap into action from a point of inaction. Myoglobin is a protein in the muscles that binds with iron and oxygen, and is responsible for the color of flesh. The fast twitch muscle fibers have a low amount of myoglobin, resulting in the light pink color and the term light meat. In contrast, dark meat is composed of slow twitch muscle fibers used for sustained use. They have a much higher myoglobin content and are therefore much darker in shade and redder in color. Vertebrates have different types of muscles depending on their lifestyle. Mammals tend to have high amounts of dark meat, while reptiles, birds, and amphibians tend to have high amounts of light meat. Obviously, this isn't always the case as different groups have adapted to different lifestyles. To figure out what muscles Velociraptor had, we need to compare it to its living cousins and descendants. The more, the musclier. Velociraptor is a dromaeosaur. These dinosaurs belong to the Maniraptor group, which contains the Tyrannosaurs, Ornithomimosaurs, Ovaraptorosaurs, Therizinosaurs, and survived the end Cretaceous mass extinction in the form of birds. In fact, the dromaeosaur group is derived from the lineage which directly led to birds, making the thin gray line that divides them thinner and grayer. Velociraptor is a dinosaur, which also makes it an archosaur, 
Crocodiles are the cousins of the dinosaurs as they too belong to the Archosauria. However, they are removed by many millions of years and exhibit completely different habits to most known extinct dinosaurs. Therefore, the best living muscle comparisons are birds, followed by crocs. Birds, being about as diverse as the entirety of the Dinosauria clade, have different kinds of muscles in different parts of their bodies, and those muscles differ dramatically from one species to another. Dark meat is used by birds for sustained activities, like walking for ground birds and flying for seabirds. Light meat is used by birds for quick burst activities like flying. A chicken, for instance, has a lot darker meat in the legs and neck, but light meat in the breast and wing. Ducks and geese, on the other hand, have darker meat in their breasts and wings, since they tend to fly more consistently for long periods of time. Crocodilians are oddballs in barely being reptiles at all. These archosaurs can change their metabolisms and go many months without food. They have a mix of dark and white meat throughout their bodies, with darker meat in the limbs and torso, and light meat in the tail and neck. Now that we have a good comparison, we can look at the Velociraptor skeleton to hypothesize what muscles it had. Velociraptor didn't have the extremely deep sternum birds used to fly. Though it wasn't capable of powered flight, Velociraptor and its relatives were far more developed in that part of the body than other theropod dinosaurs. Their shoulder girdles were large, strap-like, and probably connected to rather large blobs of muscles. A specimen of a Velociraptor arm preserved a series of divots in the wrist bone. These divots are called quill knobs, and most living birds have them. They help to anchor the hard quill part of the major flight feathers to the arm. The presence of these knobs in a presumably flightless theropod means Velociraptor was using expansive feathery wings for something. This evidence means it's probable Velociraptor had big blocks of muscles in the arm and chest. The first description of Velociraptor characterized the remains as belonging to a fast raptorial critter that ran around on the ground to snap at small animals or to attack larger animals with quick scissor-like bites and slash with hand and foot. This was confirmed with the discovery of a rare snapshot in time. Mongolia's dueling dinosaur specimen consists of the skeleton of a Velociraptor and a Protoceratops locked in combat, exactly how they died. One arm of the theropod is clenched between the shear-like jaws of the Protoceratops, while it has one of its feet jammed into the gut area of the herbivore. Clearly, Velociraptor was an active, warm-blooded, feathered theropod dinosaur that could likely complete long bouts of sustained activity, as well as short, quick bursts. Therefore, we can be reasonably sure Velociraptor had blocks of dark meat, as well as light meat. The arrangement would probably be somewhat similar to the wild jungle fowl from which humans have derived the domestic chicken. Dark meat in the legs allowed sustained speeds for chasing down prey and for casual ground patrol. The foot claws of Velociraptor, as well as other dromaeosaurs, are capable of extreme flex and strong grip. These capabilities suggest they were also adept climbers. Slow twitch muscle fibers would be of great use in climbing up trees and running down logs. Based on a large, scoop-shaped pelvic girdle, muscle scars present in the leg bones, and the width of the bones at the base of the tail, we can be reasonably sure these dinosaurs had large blocks of muscles in the calves, thighs, and base of the tail. A combination of slow and fast twitch muscle fibers therefore may have connected the thighs to the body and tail. Most tailed tetrapods have a muscle called the caudofemoralis, which connects thigh to tail. This muscle helps in retracting the leg when taking a step. It's super obvious if you watch a gator or lizard walk because you can see the tail move in the direction of the leg taking the stride. Dinosaurs had this muscle, so Velociraptor did too. This muscle helped the Velociraptor walk, but also to snap into fast movements for prey capture or predator evasion. Dark meat is usually present in the parts of the body which constantly move, but don't have large blocks of muscle. These places would be the neck, hands, wrists, feet, and head. Velociraptor needed to hold their head and neck in a neutral position when walking and running. Being so much like a bird, it probably had a similar muscular arrangement in these areas. Now that we've hypothesized the placement, kind, and amount of muscles Velociraptor had, we now need to figure out how they tasted and best ways to serve it. Taste of Raptor the taste of meat depends on a few key factors. 
the animal's diet, ecology, health, genetics, and what cut of meat you eat. The distinction between light and dark meats also encompasses a difference in flavor. When it comes to bird flesh, the light meat is also lighter in flavor. The light meat is mild and lean. The dark meat, in contrast, is more flavorful and juicier. This is a general rule, but it gets twisted when the other factors of meat flavor come into play. The dark meat of mammals is even more flavorful and juicier, with larger amounts of fat overall than bird flesh. The more myoglobin in the flesh, the more flavor there is. Diet also plays a key role in the flavors of meat, sometimes resulting in subtle notes or putrid scents. You could be relatively confident a critter living its entire life in the muck at the bottom of a pond eating worms and scum is going to smell and taste just about as unappetizing. Ecology and diet are interconnected cogs in the machine of nature, and so they are interconnected processes which result in different meat flavors. On the whole, predator meat tastes gamey and gross, while herbivore meat is less gamey and even tasty. Chicken and turkey meat taste great, but hawk or vulture meat is putrid, gamey, filled with bacteria and parasites, and has the distinct stench of death and sulfur. Ducks are fattier, greasier birds, since they eat a lot of pond organisms. Seafaring birds, which consume large amounts of fish in their diets, contain the distinct aroma of seafood in their flesh. Bad luck to kill a seabird. A bird that eats mostly crustaceans would taste better than a bird that eats mostly fish. Birds that consume grains, seeds, fruits, and veggies are going to taste way better than the others. This is why farm-raised turkeys, chickens, cows, and pigs are basically the main protein source for the world. I mentioned genetics as another factor in meat flavor. This has more to do with what kind of animal we're talking about. Birds have some of the most protein-rich meats due to the amount of work they do throughout their lives, running, jumping, flying. Mammals tend to have tastier meats due to a higher amount of both myoglobin and fat. Fish is such a varied category that there's a fish for every type of meat and meat flavor, with active, protein-rich fish like tuna, or inactive, fat-rich fish like sardines. Frog legs are made of a similar flesh to the white meat of birds, thus the it-tastes-like-chicken idiom. Health is the last factor I mentioned, and the easiest to sum up. A healthy, virile animal is going to taste way better than an old, sickly one. Let's take a look at how these factors might affect the flavor of a velociraptor. We know what types of meat they may have had. We've got the tastier dark meat and the milder light meat. Velociraptor is known far and wide as a voracious raptorial predator, and the fossil evidence bears some of that out. They were swift, probably mildly intelligent, and could snap up prey varying from bite-sized to a little larger than itself. It originates from Mongolia at a time when it was much wetter than today, but still marked by vast deserts of dunes. This sort of lifestyle means these guys probably didn't taste all that great. Being a predator, I'd steer clear of eating a velociraptor as its flesh probably wasn't tasty right off the bat. Hawks and eagles are said to have kind of gross meat. Obviously, the predator meat is bad rule can be overturned since some predators have meat that's just fine. Since Velociraptor looked and probably acted somewhat similar to a hawk, but on the ground, its flesh may have been similar in taste from a similar prey type. As one of the smaller predators in late Cretaceous Mongolia, it would have had to take up scavenging to survive. A scavenger is never tasty. Remember, don't eat vulture. A part-time predator and part-time scavenger is just a bad idea for the dinner table, no matter how healthy the Velociraptor. Despite the genetic relations to crocs and birds, the meaty drumsticks, wings, and tail of the Velociraptor just won't be worth the price of time travel to obtain. But say you wanted to cook and eat one anyway, how would be the best way to prepare and serve it? To cook and serve. As with all meat, you can prepare it with just about any herbs and spices. The base of the tail would hold most of the meat of the tail, since about two-thirds of the tail was made of bunched up rods of bone. This would make a good plate addition to the whole bird, so I'd dress it and roast it along with the rest of the carcass. Traditionally, you cut the neck, head, and feet off the bird before preparing it for the oven, but I figured we could leave them on the Velociraptor to add some flair to the presentation. That neck meat will make a great stock, or can be eaten on its own, so keep it if so desired. Roast Turkey Style 
I'll be showing you how to cook your Velociraptor like you would a turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. Your list of ingredients includes unsalted butter, fresh herbs, lemon, onion, garlic, kosher salt, and freshly ground pepper. Don't get any of that pre-ground stuff. Grinding your pepper results in a fresher, stronger taste, plus you can set it at whatever size ground you want. I prefer medium, but it's up to you. With a turkey, you'd need two sticks of butter, a whole clove of garlic, a whole onion, and a whole lemon. But since our Velociraptor here is a bit bigger than a turkey, we'll have to up the ingredients. Two lemons, four sticks of butter, three onions, and two garlic cloves. For this Velociraptor, I'm thinking of going with sage, parsley, and a little cilantro for the seasoning herbs. Let's begin! You'll want to rest your Velociraptor so it can get to room temperature if it isn't already. Preheat your largest oven to 400 degrees while your Raptor rests for around an hour. Your Velociraptor should already be plucked and deorganed, but if it isn't, take out your strongest knives. You may also opt for a bone saw, but it might not be required. Cut off the neck and remove the giblets, since these parts will make a decadent gravy, rich and dark, meaty flavors. Since I'll be taking the meat off the neck for other meals, I will be seasoning the neck and cooking it with the carcass. Next, you'll want to dab the body dry with some paper towels. Tuck the wings underneath the body and season the inside of the body cavity with your salt and pepper as desired. I would usually go with a medium amount since the outside is what you want to worry about over seasoning. Next, we'll be heading on over to the seasoning spread. Take three sticks of butter together with lemon zest from the two lemons, sage and cilantro, and mix them together in a large mixing bowl. Better to go with a bowl that's too big than one that's too small. Next comes the fun part. You'll next need to create a pocket of space underneath the skin to place the rest of your butter. Using a wooden spoon or spatula, carefully separate the flesh from the skin while leaving the skin as an intact sleeve covering the carcass. Spread butter underneath the skin as desired. Make sure not to puncture the skin or the butter will melt out of the skin and the insides will get dry. Next stop is the roasting rack. Place your speed thief on an extra large roasting pan with a roasting rack. Using the end of a spoon, spread your butter and herb mix all over the outside of the bird. After the carcass is covered, season with salt and pepper. Next, we'll be stuffing the inside of the raptor with our aromatics. Skin your onions and slice them into halves or quarters and shove them inside the carcass. Make sure to evenly distribute the onions so that they flavor the whole bird. Deskin and separate your garlic cloves and place them inside the raptor, along with any remaining herbs as well as all of the parsley. Tie up the raptor's legs if desired for presentation. You'd want to cook a turkey till the center portion of a thigh is around 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 75 degrees Celsius. But this is a velociraptor that is a tad larger, so go with something closer to 175 degrees Fahrenheit, 79 to 80 degrees Celsius. This should take anywhere from two and a half to four hours. As it roasts, construct a tent of aluminum foil and place it atop your raptor to prevent overbrowning. Once the bird is done, take the critter out and let it rest for about half an hour or till it reaches room temperature before carving. And there you have it, your finished turkey dinner style Velociraptor carcass. Hopefully it wasn't a waste of time and the herbs and seasoning can cover up the gross taste of the raptor meat. I just want to wish y'all in the US a happy Thanksgiving. This has been a slow motion car crash of a year and there isn't much to be thankful for, but at least some of you get to be with your family and to consume some delicious, nap inducing bird flesh. For those that can't, I feel you. We'll get through it and maybe we can hope for Christmas time. I'm gonna be honest with you. I was hoping the Velociraptor would taste better. Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, Arda Bayer, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron.